We will now hold our third panel, the B in BRIC Brazil as a rising power. The panel will discuss the changing power and the business dynamics brought about the rise of Brazil. To chair the session, we honor to call to the stage Professor Thomas Trebat, Executive Director, Institute of Latin American Studies, Columbia University. Muito obrigado. É um grande prazer estar aqui. Do saúdo primeiro o governador do Rio de Janeiro, Sérgio Cabral. Seja muito bem-vindo, Mário Garneiro, Marcelo Odebrecht. Uh, I will introduce them now in English and say a few introductory comments, but uh, some of the remarks will be in Portuguese, so I know we have a very bilingual uh, audience, or you have their uh, apparatus uh, to, uh, uh, to follow along the presentations. But it's a, it's a great pleasure, it's a great honor uh, to have these uh, three distinguished uh, gentlemen here as part of our, our Brazil panel, and sort of to get uh, the audience maybe to think a little bit now specifically about the B in Brick, which is the title of our conference, uh, I thought of at least three reasons to frankly celebrate Brazil, without assuming that all problems have magically disappeared. And I think the first reason to celebrate Brazil is clearly what motivates this panel of business leaders and senior political figures is Brazil's economic advance through market-oriented uh, economic reforms uh, with a very active involvement of the state, this particular Brazilian model uh, and how successful it has been. And we like to always, of course, compare Brazil with China. And if it may be said that China is the world's factory, certainly Brazil is its farm. And more than its farm, uh, it is its depository of natural resources for the global economy. Uh, and perhaps no natural resource now more in uh, our eyes and on our radar screens than oil. Uh, and I would remind you that 85% of Brazil's uh, known reserves and oil production occurs in the state of Rio de Janeiro. So it's another reason to celebrate Sergio Cabral's uh, presence among us. So the first reason is, is Brazil's a clear economic advance uh, and uh, done the hard work of stabilization on the basis of reform. And I think you know that already. Um, and it's not to say Brazil is immune from the oscillations in the global economy that await us. But nonetheless, this is a remarkable achievement and it is worth celebrating. The second is uh, its progress in terms of human development, which is probably even more important, which is certainly more important. Um, uh, the improvements uh, in Brazil, despite the many problems, improvements at all levels in terms of education and the average schooling of the average Brazilian and in terms of the senior most uh, uh, educational uh, institutions and their formation of researchers, at all levels a dramatic improvement with much room to still improve but a dramatic improvement in education. We've heard this morning from the Vice President that 30 million Brazilians who were in a condition of poverty now being removed from poverty and we see the indexes of inequality uh, moving down dramatically in Brazil. Those indexes of inequality move at a snail's pace across decades. But in Brazil's case, the inequality is improving very rapidly and enough it's on the basis of iconic anti-poverty programs such as Bolsa Familia uh, and other programs at the federal and state levels. So the second reason to celebrate Brazil's presence among us and welcome Brazil here this morning is in the social field. But the third uh, is um, perhaps uh, one uh, that we should also celebrate, or even more so, and that's the celebration as Brazil's democratic consolidation. We take for granted, those of us in the United States, that of course it's a Western democracy, uh, but in fact the democracy in Brazil is less than 30 years old uh, from a period of merging from a military rule and a dictatorship to one that is one of the most vibrant, chaotic, yes, but vibrant and effective democracies in the Western uh, world today. That is uh, 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 a remarkable accomplishment of Brazil in the last 30 years. One of our authors here at Columbia University, Al Fischlow, has written a book called Starting Over, 
and it's the history of the economy of Brazil since democrat democratization in the mid-1980s. But indeed, this is a, a country that in many respects, mindful of its 500-year history, started over 30 years ago. Um, and it has done, I think, a job that is important not only for Brazil and for the Brazilians, but for all of humanity. And it is worth celebrating, even as we uh, talk critically about what still remains to be done economically, socially, and politically in Brazil. So I think that's the importance of Brazil. In other BRIC labs, we'll be looking more uh, at some of the other uh, countries that comprise the BRICs. But today, in a sense, it's Brazil in the spotlight. And, um, and to help us to see Brazil uh, as a dynamic center, a democracy uh, um, committed to education, to economic advance, and to a dynamic business sector, I'm very pleased to welcome and I'll be introducing them um, uh, in the order in which they'll be speaking. I'll take my seat uh, among them in just a moment. But we have on my left uh, someone, um, Mario Garnero, uh, the chairman of Brazil Invest, who remembers, as I do, Mario, uh, Brazil's difficult passage uh, through times of economic, social, and political turbulence. Uh, he, um, uh, and I'll mention, too, without creating regional rivalries. Uh, Mario Garnero is a paulista, a lawyer, uh, as I say, the chairman of Brazil Invest. And he has spent a lifetime uh, building bridges, uh, socially, culturally, and particularly in terms of business between Brazil and the United States. Brazil uh, and, and the West might, might say more, more generally. But Mario Garnero will speak first and draw upon that vast experience he's had in difficult times and times that aren't so difficult in promoting uh, uh, Brazil, business in Brazil, um, economic opportunity in Brazil, and therefore social advancement in Brazil. He will talk to us first. Uh, we will then be followed by um Baiano, someone from the northern state of Bahia. It's Marcelo Odebrecht. Uh, Marcelo Odebrecht, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Brazil, his last name doesn't sound very Brazilian, but it is very synonymous with infrastructure and construction and the domestic Brazilian economy, which is so dynamic. Indeed, his firm, his family firm, which he is now, of which he is now the CEO, uh, is, uh, is one of Brazil's leading so-called multilatinas, multinationals, as Brazil presence globally through its largest firms grows. Marcelo de Brecht is participating in the building of Brazil, literally the building of Brazil and Brazilian infrastructure but sharing Brazilian expertise globally, as you can read in his biography. And our final guest, our guest of honor, who will correct what I have said and what the other speakers will have said before him, we are very pleased to welcome Governor Sergio Cabral of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and uh, among the many accomplishments you'll read in his uh, biography, one that you may not read. Well, you'll read there that he was elected with two-thirds of the vote in a state famous for political uh, fractionalization, for division uh, of political loyalties. He won the, his first campaign for governor with two-thirds of the vote. And President Obama wants to know how you did this, Governor. Four years later, he won with two-thirds of the vote. So there's a stubborn one-third that he hasn't been able to convince yet but he certainly has the solid majority of citizens behind him in a state that was in desperate need of consistent, transparent, uh, forward-looking political leadership. He has given uh, it uh, to that state uh, at just the right time. Brazil's, Brazil's designation as the seat of the World Cup in 2014 and Rio as the host of the Olympic Games in 2016 could not have happened. He won't take the credit himself. But as the governor, he deserves a lion's share of the credit for the image of Brazil. It's indeed an inspiring human story of a city and a state uh, uh, being reborn, a nascença, a renaissance uh, of this iconic area uh, of Brazil. So he, he represents Rio de Janeiro. So we, we'll, uh, uh, for those of you not familiar with Brazil, we have a wonderful regional, uh, different regional perspectives uh, uh, at, at, uh, at work is here well to give you a, a glimpse of the, the country's amazing diversity. I, I think we'll remain seated, Mario, uh, but I'll turn, uh, that's probably too much for me, I'll turn to Mario Ganero for uh, our, our first comments and welcome him.
Welcome, Mario. The governor, Thomas. Thomas uh, is more Brazilian. We have been, he was uh, having an audience with the ambassador when the, and with the, Sergio, with the governor Cabral and was fluently speaking Portuguese and now is now our latest import to Rio. I think the governor just as important uh, Thomas into Brazil as well as Colombia. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. We sustain this kind of uh, forums and discussions for a long while and I think that uh, now Brazil is starting to have a position where the discussions could be much more fruitful than at the time that Thomas was telling with up and downs that have been a constant in Brazilian life. Notwithstanding this up and downs, I think that Brazil has since 1981, where 88 was the new constitution, uh, create here the conditions for a stable development, but most important than that, has created also the conditions for stabilizing the, uh, the currency. When you see uh, still what governors making in Rio, uh, putting in all the all those areas that were you used to call the favelas and the slums, uh, you would think how Brazil, that's a country that uh, will be perhaps by the end of next year uh, one of the fifth largest economies in the world, how Brazil could support the disc discrepancy in uh, people living well and people living in the favelas or other areas. And this imbalance was created just for one world repeated three times, inflation, inflation, and inflation. We are used and we are accustomed to inflation, and inflation create all the social imbalances we have had in Brazil. It was not the monies that were spent in health and education, because we are spending about 5% of our GNP for a long time was inflation that create all those imbalances. So when uh, Brazil had had a chance of uh, uh, putting this uh, currents under control, uh, the result was that together with some res reforms that were made under the President Cardoso, and most important was uh, the dynamism that President Lula brought, create a climate where Brazil could have had a big jump on that. Talking about the fifth large economy maybe does not represent uh, is something abstract. But it's not so abstract when you think that Brazil has today $15,000 uh, uh, revenue per capita and it would be in 20 years having around $30,000. So with just this five, this 10 years or 15 years, that will lead Brazil to be a developed country, let's say, in terms of the other countries in uh, Europe, mostly in Europe. And the, so another point that looks to me to be very interesting is that we have been discussing immersion and submersion economies. I do not think that the BRICS specifically, and when I talk BRICS, I think there is Indonesia, Korea, other countries that are financing the liquidity in this world, financing the states and financing the Europe and the part in Japan, using our, our reserves for help in the liquidity within the world, the financial world. And I think that this countries have to be called not anymore emerging economies, because if China is emerging economy, how could you explain, uh, explain the position of Spain, France, and other countries in Europe? So I think that there is a changement in the position 
of Brazil is changing on the position of the BRICS. And most important, this change is not a pictorial uh, change. It's based upon real currency, real investments, and a real rep, uh, help on the uh, on the strategy of the international governments. So the question for Brazil now is to keep the pace, to, to complete this, uh, the reforms that have to be done, but, for, uh, but also to participate very actively in all kinds of financial institutions internationally, to have also access and fight for access in all this kind of organisms international. Uh, now we have the FAO that's led by a Brazilian. But I would say when Lagarde was, and I have nothing with Lagarde, she, is, she was very, uh, I met her about uh, two months ago when she was very grateful for the support that the Brazilians gave. But I would uh, leave a question. Could not be Enrique Meirelles also a good candidate for that? Could not be Carlson a good candidate for that? Could not be someone from China a good candidate from the IMF? Especially when you consider that the, the new future will be to create a sort of international kind of currency. And perhaps we are just starting with special rights or uh, drawing rights to create the first step to have a, a new currency worldwide. Just to, to finish and bring this, I was in, uh, in China, the Xinhuan University, for a debate on the new Bretton Woods. And it was very important that the chairman of the Exim Bank of Japan, uh, of China, made a very good remark. Oh, was exactly on the, week, on the week when the American senators have decided to put some pressures on, on China. And he asked, you are telling, the whole world is telling that the B is uh, undervalued. Undervalued in relation to which kind of currency? The dollar that lost 20% last year to euro that's uh, is going down, what kind of reference we do have to tell that a, today a currency is valued or undervalued? So this is I bring for a discussions. I am not expert on that, but I leave to the floor. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mario Garnero. I now call Marcelo Odebrecht to uh, address this. Marcelo, welcome. Bem-vindo. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Senador Ciro Nogueira, Governor Sérgio Cabral here. And look, I think it's, it was good because I think Mario Guarneiro gave a, a broader view about Brazil. I may be more focused in terms of business. Um, look at business. Sometimes I think that we are in different world when I came out of Brazil, and I do that quite often. I mean, we absolutely not seen a crisis yet, at least, and I hope it to be forever. And uh, I look at all, all what the world needs, and uh, Brazil might have the answer, or maybe the answer. Oh, we, we are now in Brazil, look at mineral resources. We have plenty of them. I mean, in fact, uh, sometimes I think too much. We are, uh, we are suffering the industry in Brazil. But look at, for example, the pre-South oil. I mean, the investment that you have in the oil business is like $100 billion a year for the next 10, 20 years. You look at fresh water, renewable uh, energy sources. I mean, Brazil is probably one of the few countries in the world where you can have green energy, green, uh, green business, green economy without subsidies. I mean, Brazil metrics, energy metrics, is pretty much 90% uh, renewable when you compare with 10, 20% in the world. We have sustainable food production and there's still much more space to grow. I mean, most of the land in Brazil is not yet cultivated. Uh, we have strong democratic institution, good macroeconomics. I mean, and I'd say that the new generation of politicians that you see in Brazil are quite good. We have active and flexible entrepreneurial classes. I'm not sure that uh, the, the businessman, uh, my, my son and my grandson, will be as flexible as we are today, but we 
that suffer in the 90s, I think we are prepared for everything else in front of us. We have a robust internal market and uh, with a growing middle class. And we still have two decades of what we call demographic bonus in Brazil. And, and on top of all that, we have the Olympics, we have the World Cup, and all related investment on top of that. So we had a lot of opportunities, but I think uh, I'd like also to talk about the gaps that we have in Brazil. And I'd like to highlight four gaps that I see in Brazil today. First of all, education. Then infrastructure, social inequality, and what I call catch-22, and I will talk more about that later. Education, by far, is the, the worst problem that Brazil faces today. Brazil is improving a lot in education, but we are still not there. Uh, education is still not a priority for the Brazilian society. You make any, any research, and the people will vote first for healthy, then transportation, maybe security, but education comes from the fourth and fifth. And when, and before we made education a top priority, I think it's not going to improve. Uh, when you look at the primary and secondary schools, uh, we, have a, we have plenty of them. Maybe it's not the quality that we need. We have plenty of school, plenty of teachers, maybe it's enough, enough quality. And we do have a lot of examples of good public school and even the poor areas of Brazil. So it probably shows that it's less a question of money and more a question of management. And uh, we can compensate part of that because the middle class in Brazil has access to very, I mean, to reasonable good uh, uh, private school with a reasonable price. In terms of technical school, we have very good ones, but very few. And look at the university, I mean, that's very unfair. Most of the good uh, public universities uh, those that get into are those that come from private schools. And we have too many lawyers, too many economists, and too few engineers. Only for you to have an idea, uh, graduate in Brazil less than 40,000 engineers a year. G Mexico, that has pretty much half of our population, pretty much, is almost double that. So we, we have a lack of engineers. Uh, but the other side of the same coin, is that we have a huge potential to improve productive. Uh, the second gap that we have in Brazil, and it's, it's already improving, but we are far, uh, not the place that we would like to be, is social inequality. I mean, we're improving. I mean, in fact, the, the middle class in Brazil has grown a lot. I mean, that's a huge market for Brazil. Take the example of the the, the, the deficit of the low-income housing. Brazil needs almost six billion or six million uh, housing in Brazil. Most of the deficit will come from the low-income class. So that's a huge market everywhere. But we still have a lot to do in the social uh, inequality in Brazil. Also, I have some numbers here that's quite impressive. Uh, in the last 10 years, we came out from 55% of D&E class to less than 25%. So the, the middle class and the top and the AB class has improved quite considerably. Uh, but all this growth in Brazil, not only is the middle class, all this growth in terms of export, of commodities, then highlight one of the third gap that I want to talk is infrastructure. Infrastructure, Brazil has, Brazil has been investing more in infrastructure, but uh, we invest in pretty much 4% a year of our GDP in infrastructure, we should be invest at least twice that. Uh, probably if you make any rank in terms of infrastructure, that's the rank where Brazil plays at the worst relatively. I mean, uh, in, in terms of quality of general infrastructure, infrastructure, there is a rank that the, of the World Economic Forum that Brazil is placed number 104. So there is 104 countries whose infrastructure is better than our infrastructure. Just to have an example about ports, there is 130 countries in the world that has better ports than in Brazil. So we have a lot to do in terms of infrastructure. Uh, we do have a lot of challenges with regard to the inf infrastructure. The first of them is the consequence of what we call mistrust, mistrust culture. In Brazil, uh, sometimes it's better not to do anything than to make a decision. Uh, and there is very few uh, politicians, there are very few 
people at the government level, and you have one in front of you that is capable of making a decision because uh, in Brazil there is a mistrust in terms of any relation between the private and the public sector should be a reason of mistrust. So uh, there is very few of, at the public level that prefer to make a decision. Most of them prefer not to make a decision. That's always easier. Uh, timeless in granting environmental license in Brazil can take five to ten years for you to develop a new, a new project. Shortage of skilled labor. We are facing huge difficulties in, in, in labor force in Brazil. Brazil unemployment rate now is 6%, so it's almost full employment. And, and what, especially locally fund financing. I mean, it, it's difficult when most of the growth in Brazil will come from internal market. We do have access to dollar denominated debt, but we want to invest for the internal market, so it's, it's real denominated revenue. How we can do that if we don't face if you don't have lock, uh, local long-term financing real. And then, after education, social inequality, and infrastructure, that comes with the fourth gap that I call the, the catch-22. Catch-22 is the first is the interest. Look, uh, Brazil tries to put a, has a very high interest rate and to keep inflation low, but at the time it's hurting the government budget. For you to have an idea, the government pays 5% of the GDP in interest every year. I mean, the consumers, the consumers pay somewhere between 20 and even 150% a year. That's the interest rate on the credit cards. And, and we don't have local financing for, for long-term projects. We are still reliable totally on BNDES, the National Development Bank of Brazil, but until when? I mean, we have to develop other alternatives. Larger companies, I told, do have access to dollar-denominated debt, but not to invest in, lock, in, in Brazil looking at the internal market. And the second catch-22 is the macroeconomics. I mean, Brazil has very good macroeconomics, but in order to do that, we have a very high tax burden. So 34% of our GDP is tax. Uh, our currency account is very good. I mean, in terms of the trade balance, Brazil has a huge surplus. The foreign direct investment, huge surplus. But then, I mean, the industry is suffering a lot. The real is probably the most evaluated currency in the world. And for you to have an idea, just for some numbers, Brazil exports to China roughly $30 billion a year. 90% of that are commodities. And we are importing $25 billion a year. 90% of that is manufacturers. So the industry is suffering a lot. For you to have an idea, in the last two years, in the last two years, from 2009 to 2011, the domestic consumer growth was almost 40%. The industrial growth was 3%. It means that most of the growth was taken by imports. So the industry is suffering a lot in Brazil. Said that. I mean, uh, we, like I think many of the countries in, in Latin America, we are an island of optimism. We do have our gaps, we do have our social gaps, and we do have our bottlenecks, but I think when I look at Brazil, I think the destiny of Brazil is growth, and we have a very good perspective in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for that wonderful. Al senhor governador quer, uh, por favor, do uh, passo a palavra ao, ao senhor governador. It's my nota técnica, technical note. We have translation available? Yeah, Correct? I was speaking Portuguese. Uh, do we have translation available? Yes, okay. yes, there is a translation. Okay, muito bem. Seja bem-vindo, senhor governador. Well, thank you very much. É um prazer tê-lo. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, Obrigado, Tom, pelo convite. Prazer. Obrigado você que é o diretor executivo do Instituto de Estudos Latinoamericanos. In your director for Latin American Studies of the University, I'd like to congratulate Marcelo de Brest and Mario Garneiro. Cumprimentar o senador Ciro Nogueira. Say hello to Senator Nogueira. Ciro Nogueira, senador pelo Piauí. Deputado Federal Simão Cecim, Say hello to Rio de Janeiro. Federal Representative Simão Cecim, Federal Representative Alexandre Santos, meu Secretário de Estado de Desenvolvimento Econômico, Júlio Bueno, My Secretary for Economic Development, Júlio Bueno, 
e nossos queridos coordenadores do BRIC Lab, Universidade de Colômbia, coordenadores do BRIC Lab, Marcos Troijo e Christian Desiglis. Eu acho que essa iniciativa é uma iniciativa muito importante para o Brasil, for Brazil, uh, e particularmente para o Rio de Janeiro, and onde nós for Rio estamos Janeiro, desenvolvendo com a Colômbia uma parceria an de longo prazo. Temos o prazer hoje de ter o escritório uh, voltado para a questão urbanística de arquitetura do Estúdio X na cidade do Rio de Janeiro. House in Rio. Uh, temos uh, o prazer de estarmos num progresso muito grande We have the pleasure to be para a implantação de um full progress for uh, global center, a Columbia Global Center, da Colômbia também no Rio de Janeiro. In Rio de Janeiro. Uh, já há um trabalho desenvolvido com a prefeitura There's also an ongoing work with the city hall of Rio de Janeiro in the area of education that we are going to improve at, at the state uh, level. Bom, primeiro o Marcelo Debrecht desenhou desafios e problemas no Brasil, mas é bom citar que a empresa que ele preside But, uh, the company, vai faturar esse which ano mais de 40 bilhões de dólares. Dollars this year. Isso tudo ele reclamando all desse problema de todos. Still complaining about all the problems he has. Imagine if everything was going all right. Uh, mas claro que nós temos desafios. But, uh, of course temos desafios. we have challenges. E esses desafios And eles these challenges, they já que nós estamos num range tempo, since we are in a temple here. O pensamento do estudo acadêmico, academic studies of knowledge of this incredible capacity of North American society of combining o centro acadêmico com the a vida como with life as it is, o lado produtivo with the productive side, com o produtivo com a economia real. Sector, with a real economy. É importante a gente important refletir that we reflect, uh, on sobre os BRICS, especialmente BRICS sobre o Brasil, um aspecto Brazil, central, que é a aspect, questão democrática. That is the democratic question. O Brasil, Brazil, uh, passou o século XX, uh, uh, went through the 20th century practically without any democracy. Nós tivemos a primeira eleição direta We had the first direct election for president in Brazil in 1946. Uh, with the election Dutra. of Dutra, the president seja, Dutra. Uh, already at the end of the second half of the uh, 20th century. Esse período democrático This demorou 18 anos. Esse democratic period lasted only 18 years. E durante esse período de 18 anos, anos period, um presidente one se matou. President killed, committed suicide. Getúlio Vargas. Getúlio Vargas. Um presidente renunciou. One president. Com menos de nove meses de governo. An office, with less than nine months in um office. Um presidente sofreu quadros, um golpe militar. And one president suffered a military coup. Em 1988, o Brasil consagra a democracia plena com a Constituição nova, a Constituição democrática, e a partir de 1989, eleições diretas para a presidência da República. Então vejam, so, as you can uh, see, nós estamos we are nos Estados Unidos da América, o país is a country with strong democratic roots, totally committed to democracy, that has fought in the entire world, in, in, in all the world, authoritarian regimes that have fought for democracy, and participated in a war together with allies facing a monster of authoritarianism and, and Uh, preconceived ideas, e hoje, and today we are here present in front of you to talk to you about a country that has few years of democracy, but a, demo but a deep 
rooted democracy and developed in very um fully developed in these very few years. We have a national congress that is free. Uma imprensa livre, we have free press, partidos políticos livres, political parties that are free, uma justiça soberana, a, a, a sovereign justice system, uma sociedade livre, a, a free society. E talvez esse seja o um grande diferencial do Brasil em comparação com as demais países do BRIC. Brasil, as opposed to other BRIC countries. Esse é o grande ativo this do Brasil. is the big asset of Brazil. O Brasil, Brazil não tem problemas does not have problems etnias, of ethnic nature, religion não nature. É uma de it's um not a society único. of a single party. It's not controlled by internet. the Google is not censored, internet is not censored. Não se é a we a no are país not forced to enter the country making a society with local the local negócios, party members in order to make businesses. E é and it's not also divided in castes. Or Temos desafios. We have challenges. Desafios muito sérios. Very serious challenges. Desafios, challenges. Uh, that Marcelo presented here very correctly. Some of these challenges are part of the democracy. For example, for instance, Marcelo mentioned a topic here that is very important, which is the question of the environmental license for infrastructure works. Today, we have a Brazilian society that is democratic. Me, as a governor, many times I have works that are stopped, interrupted due to of uh, uh, demands from the part of the uh, uh, environmental authorities, sometimes fair, sometimes unfair. But I prefer that this is the way then Uma a society where the Central Committee decides to build a road with 300 kilometers and, and leaves you alone and please, uh, I'll do whatever I want and I build my and who cares about the environment? Então, so Brazil has problems. Uh, we don't have democratic maturity. The public accounts are controlled auditores. by auditors that often uh, exaggerate that often uh, they punish the managers in an unfair way, but uh, thankfully we do have auditors and we do have control of the public accounts. And thanks, thanks, we, I am a journalist as a profession, I'm a, I'm a, a son of journalists, and I visited my, my father in jail in the 70s because he owned a newspaper that spoke against the military system. Thankfully, we have a free press. We are here in Columbia University. One of the references of the, for, of, the, of the making of the press in the world, these assets are Brazilian assets as well, together with macroeconomical bases that we conquered, like Mario Garneiro said very well, that inflation it was undoubtedly a a terrible and perverse threat to Brazilian society. Me and Marcelo, we come from a generation where in the morning a price of a product was X, lunchtime was X plus 20%, and for dinner it was X plus 50%. And where capitalism, the financial capitalism invented instruments, abominable instruments, to rep, uh, pay back of the capital that were that ignored the, pro the, the, product, the acti activi production activity. This was changed in the 90s with the, real, the Plano Real. And we're with the presidency for eight years of Fernando Henrique Cardoso that had the merit to consolidate the macroeconomical basis of Brazil and at the same time open Brazilian capitalism to investors, foreign investors, open the companies to 
foreigners. Veio o presidente Lula. With President Lula, o mercado the market enxergava com muito preconceito. O saw him with not so such open eyes, uh, uh, fearfully. Sometimes uh, there was uh, the, the exchange rate had a huge increasing decreasing value with the government of Lula, and he demonstrates an enormous. Uh, is very serious with the macroeconomical basis, and at the same time, he solidifies the social politics and the distribu distribution of income. And he allows that more than 40 million Brazilians enter the middle class, and he establishes a program, a development program for Brazil with planning, and uh, then Minister Dilma Rousseff he sees in Minister Rousseff the leader of the project of the development in Brazil in the energy sector, in the infrastructure sector, and it generates the opportunity, growth opportunity in Brazil, generating a content politics, a national content politics to sectors, strategic sectors such as petrol and gas. Voltando a desenvolver a developing nacional. again the national Hoje, industry today if we have anunciados e já and we have already announced and already being implemented uh, research centers da General Electric, of General Electric Halliburton Baker and Hughes Bacon Hughes British Gas British Gas entre outras among others no Rio de Janeiro, In Rio de Janeiro, this investigation center are focused on the energy, energy sector because we had a content politic uh, at the national the level. Naval the uh, naval industry sector in Brazil that was totally dead in Brazil has today an enormous relevance in generating employment in the entire uh, shore of Brazil, coastline of Brazil. The techno technological center, softwares, has developed a lot, a lot combined with the development of the energy sector in Brazil. So today, Brazil has an agenda, of course, uh, face vis-à-vis uh, -vis the world with enormous challenges, with a crisis in Europe, with the United States undergoing a situation that is very, very challenging, that I am sure will be overcome, but the poverty in the United States is increasing, unemployment is high, and this is an enormous challenge in the American market. And I am sure that this will be overcome. And at the same time, the relationship with the emerging countries, Marcelo referred correctly uh, with the relation to the, to the value added, to the necessity of adding value to the exports, to our products. Brazil, Brazil today still exports a lot of, of commodities, like Marcel said. We have, uh, we have some problem with still adding value. Education is pointed by Marcelo. This is a question that is very relevant. But there's a cause for this. There's a cause that was something that was neglected for decades, and from the 1988 Constitution of Brazil, we universalized the responsibility of the state with education. Up until this universalization of education as well as health, Brazil is one of the rare countries in the world that has in its constitution the obligation uh, from the Brazilian state uh, the federal government, state government, uh, town halls to offer education and health for all. We have in the health the, the single universal health system and education, like Marcel mentioned today, all children are in classrooms today. When we universalize, Money is never enough for us to universalize and pay to the teachers the salary 
that they deserve, a quality salary. So there's an effort, a great effort, from the part of the Brazilian society to overcome this challenge, giving education the status that it deserves and uh, making some reflections, uh, giving some thought to the American model, for instance, was a totally different model from the Brazilian model. The universities, public universities in Brazil, are uh, good reference university that are paid by the state and that have 70% of its uh, registered students, uh, students that have assets to, they have they have the means to pay for the university but they don't so the brazilian model it's a model that needs to be rethought we need to rethink this model these are universities that uh, use up too many resources to serve a layer of the population of which 70% come from the schools that Marcel, Marcelo referred, private schools of high, perfor high performance private schools. So there's a certain, there's a deep injustice in the Brazilian society and we, had not, we didn't have the courage yet to bring this debate to the table, but I believe that we are in the right road. We just elected the first woman for office, the president of Brazil, a woman who is committed, deeply committed to the Brazilian development, with a democracy, with the, the funda macroeconomical fundamental points, and I see a brilliant future for Brazil, a country with 190 million inhabitants. We don't have a billion and point three. So when we speak with 40 million more in middle class, in 190 million, this is relevant. All the regions in Brazil today are going develop, undergoing development. The Northeast is a region that had underwent more development in Brazil. There's politics for the distribution of income that is committed for the, with, the, with the three levels of government. So I have no doubt that this center of studies that was here launched, that was launched in this venue, will have a lot to debate, collaborate with progress and development in Brazil and undoubtedly with the progress and development with the other countries that make up the brick. Each one with their single characteristic, its culture, its history. Countries that are very diverse with different characteristics. We cannot compare the story, the history of Russia with the history of Brazil or the history of India with the history of China. The, they all have independent individual situations that have in common first, uh, like somebody from Goldman Sachs said, uh, 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 conditions that put together these countries as big emerging countries, and now, including South Africa, uh, that had the merit in, that we can give merit to President Lula in the last few years to call the world for the attention that G8 was no longer the adequate forum for the big discussions of the world, and he created the G20. The great merit of the BRICS, where Lula's president had a great role was to, to take some of the weight from the G8 and bring it over to the G20. Thankfully, the world global has other players that participate in the decisions, and Brazil is among them. Thank you very much. I think we could see uh, even those of you following it through translation, why he uh, is winning two-thirds of the vote uh, in, uh, in Rio. And I want to thank all three of our panelists. Uh, by the way, I do see Dean John Coatsworth. I want to, Dean, if I could ask you to join us up here, because we'll flow right from the end of this panel to the, to the Dean's comments. I know the Dean has some ceremonial comments to make at the end, but he'd, I'd welcome his participation in this debate. <laughs> per, perhaps uh, I will begin with a few questions. Hopefully, we'll have a few minutes with the dean's indulgence and that of your uh, of the audience uh, uh, for a back and forth with the panelists. 
and then we'll open it up to some questions uh, from the floor before we turn it over to Dean Jan Coatsworth. Welcome, Dean, um, um, uh, very much. Well, I think we saw as well um, in the three presentations by the three Brazilians why uh, if you want to hear anything critical about Brazil, you have to talk to a Brazilian because the foreigners seem to think there's absolutely nothing wrong. All the problems have been solved. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think, uh, but in this sort of way uh, of telling us about how much their country has achieved in politically, economic, and socially, they also helped us to realize many of the remaining problems. Maybe first, Senor Governador, eu faço uma pergunta ao, ao Senor. One of the areas uh, uh, that, uh, that is more synonymous with your um, rise uh, politically to the head of the government of the state of Rio um, has been uh, policies with respect to the what were antigamente chamadas favelas, what were formerly known as favelas, uh, comunidades bairro, now communities, and recognizing them. You've led the way in recognizing that the, the large uh, uh, the millions of Brazilians living in substandard housing in the cities were integral parts of the city and in fact were making very good use of the city, but they didn't benefit much from a presence of the state. Your administration in that of Eduardo Paes uh, of Rio has inaugurated many policies uh, known as pacification, uh, which is both has a police aspect and a social aspect. Eu gostaria de pedir talvez algumas reflexões breves sobre o processo e o andamento desse importante uh, programa social associado com o senhor e o conselho. Eu gostaria, I would like to ask some questions uh, about the social programs of your government. We tínhamos, had uh, in the no Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro, uma grande a big uh, it was a very confusing situation. We had a false dichotomy, a contradiction, a false contradiction that also is can be explained by the pelas lideranças políticas political leaderships that governed Rio de Janeiro. That a big mistake in entre that made a big mistake between human rights and public order. Uh, como se fossem incompatíveis. As if they were incompatible. Pelo contrário. But I say it's quite the opposite. Eu acho que os democratas de Nova York fazem essa confusão há muito tempo. New York tempo. Isso Democrats que make this confusion as well. That's why Republicans still win sometimes here in New York. Uh, uh, E não são incompatíveis. They are not incompatible. Então, no Rio de Janeiro, so, hoje, in hoje, Rio, uma, we uma, uma, um crescimento there was a growth of these communities público, without any public no local, whether, social, without any public uh, regard to it, whether it be on uh, housing, education, and also public security, public safety. E and the, territórios paralelos. And uh, e this created partida. parallel territories and this broke the city in two. What we did, what we attempted to do, was to make the political decision to recover these territories, mainly for the local inhabitants of these communities. And with this, call the attention of the city itself, the city of Rio de Janeiro, because there was some kind of lethargy from the Rio de Janeiro's elite that didn't worry how the doorman lives, uh, that serves the elites, the waiter that serves this elite, uh, the caretaker of the building, the worker of the, so the civil construction worker that uh, integrates this part of the population, integrates the inhabitants of these so-called favelas, these uh, communities. So we made a decision, of course, uh, that uh, this uh, had to go through uh, a process of changing the police. We had to break away with uh, corruption traditions, bad conduct and punishment, uh, the, get away from impunity and to establish goals. Uh, goals for the policemen and the police force with uh, variable salaries, uh, reduction of uh, the 
homicide rates and uh, car theft. And so we divided the, the, the city in regions. And the reduction of these rates allow in each semester an extra payment and a bonus payment to the policemen, uh, including with the reduction of what we call the resistance that has nothing to it's no more than a sophism that to allow the policemen to kill people. So to resist this resistance, uh, uh, this also punishes policemen for acting in this manner. With this, we achieved a good results in all the states. Uh, homicides in the entire state is the smaller, the rate is the smaller rate in all the states in several years. And in the communities, uh, the pacified communities, the revolution is, is full, it's complete, because in the moment that we entered these communities with public security, we we went in with new cops, new policemen, because this is the intention of these UPP, pacifying units. All these policemen are new policemen because we do not trust in the old ones. No, it's not because of that. It's because the policeman, uh, uh, no matter how honest he is, he already was involved with some sort, sort of uh, combat in the past, and it has in his mind some degree of distortion of the relationship with those communities because in some moment he was involved in some sort of conflict with these communities. So we cannot be impartial. So we did this elite troop that is in charge of this specification and with intelligence without shooting Without any shot, Rocinha, which was the last community to be to be pacified, Rocinha has a hundred thousand inhabitants in a privileged area of Brazil, in of Rio, between São Corrado e Barra da Tijuca. It was pacified with no fire being shot, with the tra drug traffic leaders being removed, and we're still there arresting more people. Uh, there were 30 years that they were left alone. So you can just imagine, it's a community in which it's the most privileged area, the most beautiful area of Rio de Janeiro, and it grew unlimitless with any infrastructure, with any so, uh, public Nós, systems and us, government st st state lá. system, we started to do atrás. work three years ago in this community. We did great works in Rocinha. We'll do more. This is not enough. We'll do a lot more. E, uh, and um we did not have to exchange fire only with strategy and intelligence. intelligence. It's more than a million people that are freed from this parallel power with the capitalism entering these communities, government entering these communities, with the market entering these communities. So this has very positive results. The fact that these people, oh, we can sleep now. Now I can leave my daughter, go to school, without any risk. And at the same time, these communities, the neighboring communities, uh, the real estate had, is now undergoing an enormous boom. It's it's even too much, it's, uh, but the repercussion is enormous. It's a state policy, and our, comp our commitment, when I did the campaign for the Olympic Games, I said to the members of the International Committee that we didn't want to do a safe event for you, because we can do that today, tomorrow, anytime. But we want that before, during, and after the Olympic Games, the Rio de Janeiro people can be safe, and we will achieve this. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Governor. I maybe have a question just maybe to draw in some of other participants, and then I'll turn it over to well, but the audience and then to John. Um, Marcelo, me, me call on you. Que Ele falou do fabuloso Marcelo faturamento da empresa, uh, então de brincadeira, so, mas uh, several of the uh, most important issues in Brazil, infrastructure, energy development, the Olympic Games, the World Cup, do depend on a massive infrastructure effort. Uh, how is Brazil going to do this? Uh, Maybe they're divided in parts. The massive challenge of developing the the Saudi Arabia-like oil reserves 200 miles off the coast of the governor's state. Does Brazil have the engineering scientific uh, 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 talent 
to do that now, uh, is that a doable task? Uh, what we have now. Uh, Thomas, let's first comment one thing. A uh, few years ago, where the world think Brazil has no future, it was good that the, the Brazilians had a lot of confidence in our potential. And now that one is that now everyone is bullish about Brazil. It's good to know that not only politicians, but the, the business people, we are aware about our challenges. So we are very optimistic, I think, uh, but at the same time, we know the challenge that we are going to face. I, I think uh, we'll do okay for the Olympics, we'll do okay with the World Cup. Uh, maybe for the World Cup, we'll not do as much legacy in terms of the infrastructure as we'd like to have. We'll have the stages, we'll have a nice World Cup, we'll have a nice organized, maybe the infrastructure that will be let will not be as much as we want. For the Olympics, I think that it's much well better playing. I think Rio de Janeiro, that is already a wonderful city, will be by far the best city in, that, that I can see. I mean, what's happening in Rio de Janeiro in terms of investment, in terms of uh, improving infrastructure, in terms of security, it's amazing. Uh, so we do have a lot of challenges. We do have challenges in terms of infrastructure. But we see also that as a huge opportunity. I mean, Brazil will need to invest $100 billion a year in infrastructure. And that's an opportunity to grow. And that's an opportunity to, to give, I mean, employment. Brazil will have to invest $100 billion a year in the pre salt in the oil. I'm not sure if you'll be able to do that. But if you don't do that, at least we do half of that. Yes. That's very good. I mean, so... I think it's nice to be in, in the case of Brazil that we are facing growth problems rather than uh, other type of problems. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mario. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question here uh, as a moderator. I could go on, you, as you could see, all afternoon, but don't worry, I won't. Uh, maybe while I ask that question, if anyone does want to approach the mic, maybe one on each side, to be fair, if you'd like to, please stand at the mic and I'll recognize you in due time, if you don't mind. And uh, I'll ask my final question uh, to Mario Garnero. And, and Mario, um, that is the, the particular nature of Brazilian capitalism, uh, uh, the, the way the Brazilian economy uh, works, a very large role for the state, a huge tax burden, uh, uh, um, it, it, it brings up this issue of relations between the state and the private sector. And as you, in your travels and in your, your, um, uh, your contacts with foreign investors looking at Brazil, what is it they find still lacking in Brazil? I mean, are they, do they share the bullishness that I've expressed today, or are they saying that there are important improvements in the business environment that still need to occur for Brazil to be in, at the top of their investment list? What are the issues that they raise with you? I think that... Uh of course, the tax problem is important. Not only how much you pay in tax, but uh, you cannot have about uh, uh, 200 different taxes all over the country that creates a mass in Brazil. I think that this is a very crucial point. Not how much, and none of us on the business are very, Marcelo and us are very, uh, trying to escape to, of paying tax or avoid to pay tax. But we cannot pay 200 because uh, as Price the House made a, a good study, we have more people on the accounting department to deal with this to the number of taxes down on the productive sector. But the most important point that I, I, I imagine for Brazil are two things that attract the $75 billion that are going uh, to Brazil this year. Markets, that's a market with growth, and this is the second, is that margins. Margins are vital to have companies working and having an intention to invest in Brazil. So with all this kind of problems, you would say that out of the 500 fortune companies, 470 are in Brazil. Yeah. What are they doing? They are making profits, of course, in Brazil. 
and uh, with the Sheikh Cabral bringing out the, uh, the development of uh, yeah, Petrobras and Rio. And we are talking about your very modest, I have been uh, talking about 100 billion barrels is the reserve of Brazil, and going from 2.2 million barrels this year in four years to 4.5 million barrels. Of course, Rio, that is already exploding, real estate will be exploding in other areas also in terms of uh, development. So what I, I, I would imagine is that uh, the government has to tackle with some of the problems that Marcelo brought. One specifically is about the taxation. The second is about the education, because education will be the basis for, the, for Brazil to be innovative, to be productive, and to be competitive. Thank you very, very much. And the brevity and the comprehensiveness of Dean, if it's all right, I'll take a few questions. We'll register those questions and then allow our panelists a final word to respond. I, I, I don't know how to divide side. I'm seeing five people, so I'm going to have to say pretty quickly. Uh, we'll, we'll start uh, with, uh, here, but if you could please just state your questions quickly so we can get five questions in in just a minute or two. Seem, put forward, please. Yes, hello. My name is John Bega. A question addressed to both Mario Garnero and uh, Mr. Odebrecht. Uh, the B in BRICS is the first letter of the acronym. Brazil, as uh, Governor Cabral was saying earlier, is quite different from a structural point of view from the other RICs. Mr. Garnero, I think you were traveling in Asia recently, and I suspect Mr. Odebrecht has been doing so also. How do you think Brazil fits into the plan uh, amongst the other countries? That is, do, does Brazil have the opportunity of acting as a moderator between these four completely different cultural and business approaches? Thank you. Excellent question. Thank you very much. We'll go to Paulo here on the right. My name is Paulo Ibeu. I am an MBA student here from Colombia. I would like to ask this question in English. In Portuguese, Brazil has many challenging infrastructure areas to avoid the over-invoicing delays and to have an environment that is more competitive. And it's essential that Brazil attract the main and more important companies in the world, including Brazilian. But I think that there's a legal provision that uh, doesn't allow the national companies to uh, compete in the same way as the Brazilian companies. There's uh, some sort of favoritism that is created. Shouldn't we put an end to this to create more competitiveness and more efficiency? Much. Paolo, I see Thank Tanisha you. on the left. Good afternoon. My name is Tanisha Tingle. I'm a SIPA alumna and a U.S.-based Brazilianist. Uh, the governor rightly outlined uh, one of the uh, Brazil's just adherence to democratic principles as one of the distinguishing characteristics of Brazil compared to the BRICS. I would add another uh, distinguishing characteristic is Brazil's um, limited emphasis on military prowess and power projection as it advances in different global spaces. And to this end, to what extent does the Brazilian private sector, the leading national champions, Petrobras, Vale, Embraer, Obredesh, uh, see part of its business strategy to structure or outline uh, the state's interest to accommodate Brazil's aspirations for uh, more global influence. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much, uh, Tanisha. Uh, temos a flor dos uh, alunos brasileiros, tem outros mais aqui. Cristina is, will be next. Thank you for this presentation, and my question is for the governor. Could you explain to us when and how this uh, UPP politic is going to be implemented in communities uh, with the militias? Because this time, I think this is implemented as a parallel politic anyway. I would like you to explain this to me. Thank, thank you very much, Christina. And then the final question will be yours, Alexandra. My name is Alexandra. I am a student here from SIPA. I'm a, ma a master's student. And my question is for Mr. Odebrecht. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're the number one investor in Angola, for example, and there are many Brazilian companies that are expanding in the African continent. My question is, within the context of BRIC, is Brazil positioned to have leadership or to influence the other actors in 
how to act in the development of the African continent and what type of role the private sector can have in terms of influencing Brazil and other countries to be responsible actors in international development. Thank you. Thank you very much for those five very great questions, which we will not have sufficient time to answer. I, I, eu tomei nota das perguntas, se alguém quisesse um lembrete, uh, but uh, maybe we'll do in ordem, da mesma ordem que falamos, I'll ask each of our speakers, uh, uh, Mario first, then Marcelo, and then the final word should be properly yours, uh, 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 Mr. Governor. Sim. Que foi dirigido a você. Bom, eu, eu me lembro de todas as minhas perguntas. Posso responder, então? Começamos com a... Então, eu respondo já as minhas perguntas. Bom, a minha... Em relação, não, todas não, porque houve direito... Eu vou objetivo em relação ao gaúcho, com esse sotaque dele, perguntando sobre... Não, não há nenhum limitador, não. O que há, é, o que eu me referi à política de conteúdo nacional, que, ao meu ver, é correta, é que é, estabeleceu... Antigamente, a Petrobras, por exemplo, contratava plataformas em Singapura, na Coreia do Sul. O presidente Lula, em 2002, quando foi candidato a presidente, seu primeiro programa da campanha eleitoral foi em Angra dos Reis, num uh, estaleiro da indústria naval vazio, com o mato crescendo, e que no passado havia sido um grande estaleiro, ele disse, olha, se eu ganhar a eleição, os, os navios brasileiros serão produzidos aqui. E é o que ele fez. Então, nós saímos, quando ele foi eleito, nós tínhamos menos de 5 mil trabalhadores da indústria naval. Hoje são mais de 70 mil trabalhadores da indústria naval com o número crescendo barbaramente. A Odebrecht mesmo está nesse setor, entrou nesse setor, por conta da política brasileira de expansão da indústria naval. Então, 65% do conteúdo das demandas da Petrobras, que são da ordem, nos próximos 5, 6 anos, julho, de 250 bilhões de dólares, 280 230 bilhões de dólares nos próximos cinco anos. O cálculo do pré-sal é da ordem de, em 15 a 20 anos, um trilhão de dólares. Entre 600 bilhões e um trilhão de dólares. A, pre a previsão mais pessimista é o Brasil chegar em 2020... Hoje nós produzimos 2 milhões e 200 mil barris de petróleo, nós vamos diariamente. Nós vamos chegar a 6 milhões de barris. Vamos passar o Catar, o Kuwait. Não sei se passamos o Catar, mas o Kuwait nós passamos. Inclusive, do ponto de vista geopolítico, estamos aqui numa escola tão importante We are in a school that is so important of a political global. debate and global debate. Do ponto, do, do ponto de vista geopolítico, and then the geopolitical o Brasil passa a ter um papel aspect, muito importante Brazil do ponto de vista da dependência do Oriente well Médio. As far as the as of the Se você olhar East, o nosso vizinho Venezuela, Venezuela um, example, um player Venezuela, complicado, he's a very complicated né? player. eu espero que a democracia prevaleça na Venezuela. E, e o Oriente Médio continua sendo um, 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 uma região com conflitos, com dificuldades. Então, o Brasil passa a ser um player importante para o mundo sob o ponto de vista do óleo e do gás. As licitações brasileiras, as empresas podem participar, não há nenhuma restrição. Infelizmente, eu, eu acabei de fazer uma licitação de trens urbanos, quem ganhou foi uma empresa chinesa, porque o preço da empresa brasileira foi uma licitação internacional. O preço da, da empresa brasileira era quatro vezes maior, não há, não há restrição. Sobre as UPPs, nós já estamos em comunidade da milícia, Maria a moça que me perguntou. Cristina. Cristina, eu estou falando com você. 
Já estamos em comunidades com a milícia. A milícia é diferente do tráfico. O tráfico tem um controle ostensivo do lugar. A milícia, como ela tem envolvimento de políticos, policiais e ex-policiais, nosso trabalho é um trabalho mais de inteligência, porque eles não têm um domínio físico. É raro você ter uma comunidade onde eles têm um domínio físico. Há algumas, nós estamos agindo contra elas, mas é mais, é mais sofisticada a organização, e mais perigosa. O governo que me antecedeu prendeu quatro milicianos, nós aprendemos mais de mil milicianos. Milicianos, policiais, chefes de polícia, ex-chefes de polícia de governos anteriores, deputados, vereadores. Então, nós estamos atacando muito e usando muito inteligência. Fique certo que essa é uma prioridade nossa. Creio que foram as minhas perguntas. Deixa a palavra para Marcelo. Duas das perguntas foram diretamente para Marcelo. Ok, eu posso responder as duas perguntas primeiro e as últimas perguntas juntas. Eu acho que, não é o way o Brasil e o Brasil Government, o Brasil Company, act to, to be kind of a moderator or to be a leader. Uh, we prefer to set example. I think Brazil, Brazil companies, we do act differently, I think, in Africa and Latin America, and that's why comes most of our success. Uh, we will have like, probably our company has 40,000 people working in Africa, and 95% or even more are local people. I think that's uh, the, the way we act, I think, the Brazilian companies, that we integrate with the local community. We, we do work a lot with the companies, we do partnership, and I think that's set example, a little bit different than what I see companies from the other big countries work on. But uh, we are not trying to just lead anyone to do that way, we're not trying to moderate anyone, we just set example and I hope that works. And I think it's working well for us. I mean, Latin America, and, uh, and uh, we, we are growing Latin America, China, uh, oh, Latin America and Africa because of that. And uh, first, let, and then last, let me ask you to beg everyone that can really speak Portuguese or even English and we are willing to go to Brazil. I mean, we do need people oh, get your in, in ready. Brazil. I mean, we are, our company is hiring 2,000 people a month. <laughs> and uh, so uh, and, uh, we do need people, and if you don't find employment here in the US, oh, I think great. we have plenty of those in Brazil. Very, very good. Well, that's a wonderful note for, to, to end with talking to a group of students. That's a wonderful note to end um, this very exciting session. I, I, we're and gonna he, pay, he pays very well. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Mario Garniero, Marcelo de Brecht, and especially with Governor Sergio Cabral, I think it has been happy for many reasons that Colombia is opening Global Center in Rio, but you've given us even more reason to think not only the great opportunities there, but the problems and the need to think further about their solutions, and that's an important engagement that the university welcomes and, and, and needs, to, needs to share with you, and we, we appreciate your welcome in, in that respect. So if you would, uh, we're going to turn it over to Vanessa, then to uh, Dean Coatsworth for the final words, but I, I I think I speak for all of us, and I'll ask you to demonstrate it by joining hands now to thank these three great panelists who've been with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a great conference. But now, uh, for our closing remarks on behalf of Colombia, um, I, am, I have the honor to call to the stage Professor John Coastworth the Dean of CIPA, School of International and Public Affairs, and Interim Provost of Columbia University. Please, Professor. Thank you. I want to say, first of all, thanks to all of you who have participated in this stimulating and interesting event. But I want to say a particular word of thanks to the two individuals uh, who invented the Brick Lab and coordinated the conference. One of them is right here, Christian Desiglis. <laughs> and uh, the other is Marcos Troijo. Marcos? Yeah. I'm also very pleased to thank the, con the conference sponsors, 
The Financial Times, Bloomberg, CNN, HSBC, and the Forum das Americas. Thanks also to our distinguished speakers and panelists for their contributions, and special thanks to Michel Temer, Vice President of Brazil, who you heard from earlier, and especially to my friend Sergio Cabral Filho, the Governor of Rio de Janeiro, who, both of whom have honored us with their presence. Governor Cabral has been enormously helpful to Colombia in Rio. Thank you very much, sir. Before you leave, uh, I'll try to give you just uh, three quick points to carry with you. First, as today's panels may have suggested, the differences between the four BRIC nations on some dimensions are as great or greater than the differences between them and the rest of the world. What is indisputable, at least at this moment in time, is that economic dynamism and political power are shifting, though to varying degrees, away from the leading developed countries and toward the largest of the developing nations, the BRIC nations chief among them. This is true to such an extent that leading economists around the world now claim that the fate of the global economy depends mostly on the BRIC nations and others like them. And those of us who want to be optimistic in the North Atlantic uh, are bullish on Brazil. It's not just Brazilians that are bullish on Brazil. We're bullish on uh, all of the BRIC nations, of course, with our fingers crossed. Second, this shift has huge implications for all of us in academia as well as policymaking and business. It has, always, it has already pushed all of us, universities, financial institutions, and national governments, to re-examine how we do and what we do. Colombia, for example, has opened six global centers around the world with two more to follow. Three are or will be in BRIC countries, Beijing, Mumbai, and as Governor Cabral has just announced, uh, we are working very hard to make sure that we open uh, a global center in Rio de Janeiro in 2012. The other five are in Paris, Amman, Istanbul, Santiago in Chile, and next spring in Nairobi. Another example, CIPA will, in, the CIPA will inaugurate a major new research center this spring focused on global economic governance. A key element in our decision to focus attention and resources in this way was the abundant evidence of an apparently inexorable decline of the West coupled with the apparently unstoppable rise of the West of the rest and uh, the imperative for us to understand better its implications and consequences. Third, uh, as you may have heard earlier, this BRIC lab is the first BRIC-centered, BRIC-focused center for discussion, research, and exchange in any first-rate university uh, in the developed or developing world in the United States or elsewhere. So when you leave this conference and you're thinking of the future, think of SIPA and of Colombia. Thank you all for coming and participating. Thank you very much. Now our conference is adjourned. Have a great weekend.